Yeah. Okay, everyone, uh, a very good morning or a night wherever you are. We welcome you to this seminar series once again, which is seeing its last talk today by Professor Bob. Uh, so this event was possible with a constant contact and collaboration between Professor Bob from USA, uh, me from the National Center of Excellence in Geology, though currently I'm placed in Canada, and Mukhtiar Ghani is working uh, in GSV Quetta of Pakistan. We shall not forget Mr. Ghulam Sarwar. And I remember when Bob and Ghulam Sarwar came to Pakistan probably in 2019, and they traveled across the stretch of the country to deliver this, their talks on the Shivalik Strata. Afterwards, uh, a year or so, Bob showed an interest in extending the subject, and we tried to use MS Teams for the first talk and interestingly received great interest. Uh, Bob really champions and leads this forum, and together with Mukhtar and myself, we decided to group up the people and continue the series, uh, and we identified that Wednesday every week at 9.30 Pakistan Standard Time would be the best day and the best time for this series. So, <clears throat> uh, since this series is coming, it has come to the end, uh, we have decided that we should be giving away uh, certificates to the participants, but we are just not sure about the uh, participation threshold. Probably in a few days, we'll discuss and we'll come up with the idea that what person should be applied for the uh, certification. Subsequent to this session, uh, within a few days, we are aiming to share two sorts of feedback forms. Uh, one form will be shared with the uh, participants and we urge you to complete and submit for the improvement and future planning purposes. And the second form, reach out to the presenters to see that which knowledge gaps we can identify. And obviously, Bob will discuss them in his talk today. There are several peoples uh, I would like to would, uh, appreciate for their help behind the screen. Uh, we had Professor Kasim Jan uh, constantly uh, boosting our, uh, you know, Courage or uh, from Pakistan, uh, Muhammad Saeed, who's working as Director of Planning and Information, GSP, Khalil Latif from National Center of Excellence in Geology, Jamshed Ali, Director of GSP Quetta, Muhammad Ali, Assistant Director of GSP Quetta, Nazafa, and Nahat, Assistant Director of GSP Quetta. We extend our greater appreciations to the Microsoft Teams <coughs> for providing us this constant connectivity throughout the webinar series, we use their licensed version acquired through the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. And so we are equally thankful to the HEC Pakistan for this favor. Above all, uh, I'm very much thankful to the speakers who pres presented various countries and due to their different time zone, most of whom had to wake up till late to make this event possible. So that's all from my side, Bob. And I would request you to take it further. Okay, thank you very much, Irfan. And, and I'll underline and uh, repeat my, our gratitude to everybody who's uh, made this possible. And of course, it, it's taken a team effort. Uh, my presentation this evening is, is really in, in two parts. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is to uh, review briefly the uh, participants in the seminar, just to thank everybody personally. And then, uh, then I'm going to have a a discussion about the, the character of the materials that we covered. And I'm gonna break it into a discussion of, of deformation and plates and thrust faults and things like that. And then a discussion of depositional systems, uh, the stratigraphy and the, and the rock systems. And then a discussion of the paleoecology, which would include the paleontology, taphonomy, et cetera. And, uh, and then the final point would be uh, directions for future work. And I'm hoping that I'm, I'll speak for about 35 or 40 minutes, and then we'll have a chance to have a, a nice discussion with the people who are on the call and uh, look, in, look towards the, the future. And it might also be that we talk about uh, future seminars of this character because uh, we, could, we, can, uh, have, uh, we can have more, more seminars of this character. So sorry, my camera was off there for some reason. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, an attempt here at uh, screen sharing, so uh, bear with me while this happens. And um, 
it's it's a couple of steps to make it happen here. So do you guys see a PowerPoint coming up? Yeah. That's visible, yeah. sir. Okay, good. So so I'm just going to assume that you can see what I see. And uh, I'm just going to march through this. Uh, this is a photograph I took a few years ago in the Colorado Rockies, and I'm just uh, delighted to share it with everybody. This is uh, the Columbine flowers and, and the Indian paintbrush and the, I think it's Queen Anne's lace up in the high Colorado Rockies. And just a reminder of why we are geologists. And uh, we, we love to be outside and see the rocks. And uh, I'm, I'm now going to walk through the uh, presentations, and I'm I'm just going to go through it uh, sequentially. And in the lower right-hand side, I hope you can see it, it, it says how many, how many years I've known the particular individual. So I'm going to say hi to Gary, who's with us tonight. And I think I've known Gary for 50 years. We could count the numbers, but it's uh, it's got to be 50 years. And uh, it's a, been a wonderful collaboration in many different ways over many years. And I'm profoundly grateful for Gary's continued guidance. Uh, and I'm just going to, each one of these slides is going to have the title and the name of the person. So Gary talked about the history of the Dartmouth Peshawar project. And then we had John Barry, whom I've known for a long time as well. And John talked about the history of the Yale Harvard GSP project. And then we had a talk by uh, Abdul Khayyam from Utrecht. And he talked about the plate collision and the large scale tectonics of the uh, Himalayas. We had a talk by Catherine Badgley. Again, this is just sequential. And Catherine talked about uh, using fossils to reconstruct the landscapes of the Potwar. And I've known Catherine for a long time. Uh, I think we met in uh, CORE. Uh, then we had a talk by Humad Khani from Potsdam. And he talked about uh, structural modeling and the thermal chronology uh, of the Northwest Himalayas. I've only known uh, Humad for about a month. Uh, Doug Burbank gave a talk on the overall tectonics of the region of the Himalayas and periphery. And uh, Doug and I were grad students together. I've known Doug for 45 years, mas or menos, which would be Takriban 45 years. Uh, we had a talk by Muhammad Akbar Khan from uh, Punjab University in Lahore. And I've, I've known Akbar for about a month. And he talked about the mammalian paleontology of the Potwar. And then we had a, a talk about the fossils as seen from the India side and Rajiv Patnaik, whom I've known for about a month, uh, who's based in Chandigarh at Punjab University, uh, gave us a talk about the fauna as seen from India side. Uh, Peter Cliff from LSU uh, gave a talk on the monsoons and uh, sort of a discussion about the Indus fan. And I've known Peter for about a month. Uh, Andrew Meggs gave a talk uh, from, from Oregon State University, and uh, he talked about uh, tectonics and earthquakes. And I've known Andrew uh, since, the, since I was a student in, in Pakistan, so about 30 years. Kay gave a talk, Kay Berensmeyer, who's with us tonight, gave a talk on fluvial landscapes, architecture, and, uh, and, and the taphonomy of the uh, Shawaliks. And I've known Kay for about 49 years and she's from the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and she's up after midnight, along with Gary. Uh, Sam Samina Siddiqui, who's with us tonight, uh, I've known for a couple of months, but she gave a talk on the petroleum systems uh, in the foothills of, of, of Pakistan. She's from the uh, Center for Excellence in Peshawar. Uh, Jason Head from Cambridge in England gave a talk on reptile faunas. I've only known Jason for about a month. Uh, Parth Shahan from uh, the Indian Institute of Science and Education Research uh, gave a talk on, on hominids or the absence of hominids in the Shawalik record as seen from the Shawalik Hills of India. I've only known Parth for about a month. Uh, Lisa Tauks from Scripps gave a talk on the C3 to C4 isotopic transition as calibrated by paleomagnetics. And I've known Lisa for uh, 40 plus years. Uh, Peter Zeitler gave a talk on uh, on sort of provenance and the links between the source terrain and the sink and the Shawaliks. Peter's at Lehigh University, and Peter and I were students together. Um, 
and uh, I've known him for 45 years or more. Uh, Mona Lisa from Kadi Azam University gave a talk about seismic risk hazards, and I've known her only for about a month. Uh, Turi Serling from the University of Utah gave a talk on uh, isotopes, the C3 to C4 work that he's done uh, in many parts of the world. I've known Turi for many years, 48 years or more. Uh, Shahid Iqbal from Kadi Azam gave a talk on uh, the uh, shower basin. I've known Shahid for about a month. Uh, Yanni Naiman gave a talk on uh, the regional patterns, including the Indus River and its drainage and the Indus fan. Uh, and uh, Yanni's from the Lancaster University, but she's actually, uh, she's doing a, a visiting scholar at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. And she lives up in Netherland, which is a, a mountain town uh, west of where I live. So I've known Yanni for about a year. And finally, Advait Junkar, uh, from Yale gave a talk on the uh, fauna and the uh, sort of collecting the stories about the fauna through through the different researchers and trying to calibrate the modern collections. And I've known Advait for about a month. Uh, so he, he gave a talk. So all of these people uh, gave their time. They took a lot of energy and effort. In some cases, uh, uh, they dug up old slides and old photographs and were extremely grateful to each and every one of them for their, uh, their work and their presentation. Uh, and, and many of them spoke in the wee hours of the morning, uh, some on the East Coast of the United States in the middle of the night, some in Europe getting up in the very early morning hours. Uh, and then some people in Pakistan and India were able to speak at about 9.30 in the morning. So we are very grateful to all of you. And uh, I am delighted. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing and um, Express my delight. I can't. Let's, let's see. My the default is the camera off. So I just want to. I want you to look me in the eye to hear my gratitude. So I'm really grateful to all of you for for your help. Uh, really above the call of duty to put this all together. Extremely wonderful that it, we were able to do it. And uh, having uh, sort of walked through everybody's name and uh, their relations, I, I just wanted to say there's a common thread here that I've known many of you for many years. And I think that all of us need to recognize that, that these geological stories and uh, the history of life as preserved in the fauna and fossils of the, of the Shawalix is really a, an effort that's been put together by, by many people. Uh, and it's involved many, many years of collaboration. And just to get ourselves launched here, I just want to really start with a, a discussion about the fact that you know, the Dartmouth Peshawar project that Gary got started working with Rashid Tarheli back in the 1970s uh, certainly was my entree to the subcontinent uh, and the Shawalix. And uh, Dave Pilbeam, working with Mahmoud Raza and others from the GSP, uh, Dave was at, at Yale in the beginning and then shift, shifted over to Harvard. But that those two collaborations really framed a lot of the material that you've heard in this series of seminars. And many of the speakers have, have mentioned that, uh, but I think it needs to be always underlined that there were very special people who uh, were involved in making these things happen. And it took a lot of energy on the part of uh, the people at the Geological Survey of Pakistan to put together the field camps and the uh, the logistical support for the uh, group from Yale, Harvard. And of course, Rashid Tarheli and his colleagues at the Center for Excellence in uh, Geology in Peshawar were wonderful hosts. And, you know, the work was done in very many different ways. Uh, we did work where we had individual students out, uh, you know, positioned in strange outcrops trying to gather data. We had teams of people working together collaboratively. Uh, we lived in rest houses, we lived in motels, uh, we lived in people's homes. Uh, Doug, in his comments, mentioned his work in Kashmir where he, he was very much on his own and just sort of cooking his own food and trying to uh, be, accept the hospitality of people. And, and certainly I had wonderful times like that myself in the, in the Jhelum area where, where the hospitality of the local people was a common thread that we all appreciated. And every single one of us has mentioned that. And uh, 
it's a part of the joy of of uh, this collaboration is that it's been built from the work of strong individuals who led big programs, but it comes right down to individual students, in some cases, undergraduates. We had lots of Dartmouth undergraduates involved. And, uh, and then uh, when I was teaching at Peshawar University, of course, we had lots of, of uh, Pakistani undergraduates who were involved in, in our discussions. And the common thread is, is one of, of collaboration, cooperation, uh, despite various cultural challenges and boundaries, you know, we, we've pulled together and, uh, and it's really a, a testimony to everybody's uh, support in this. And I want to mention, uh, you know, some, some uh, uh, I think Andrew Miggs mentioned Bob Yates' his name and, and Bob Yates uh, was a strong collaborator uh, early on. And, and I know he's still with us, I, I've had some emails back and forth with him. I've been emailing with David Pilbeam. He's still eager, and uh, we email back and forth. And uh, and and there's some who are no longer with us. And and uh, Rashid Tarkeli and, and Noy Johnson, for example, wonderful friends and colleagues. And we want to honor their memory um, in in our discussions here. I'm going to again screen share, so I'm going to disappear but I will uh, have a short, this is a relatively short PowerPoint, but it, it's trying to cover the, the gist of what we've got here. So stand by, um, see if, do you guys see a PowerPoint? Yeah. It's yes. Possible, sir. Okay, wonderful. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, now I'm now I'm just going to give some overview and and my overview is just you know my point of view and I'm a stratigrapher I study sedimentary rocks I'm not a paleontologist I'm I'm not an isotope geochemist so you're going to hear an overview from the point of view of a uh, of a stratigrapher and it's relatively short again I'm, I think it'll be 15 minutes or so and then I'll, we'll open it up for for discussion so all of you. Think about some questions that you can ask each other, uh, ask of me, ask of others, and uh, let's. Uh, this is pr preparatory to that discussion. So, the Shawaliks, of course, are are unique in the world, and and we somehow we sometimes um, are a little bit bashful about saying that, but uh, I think that uh, certainly in my knowledge, and I've worked in lots and lots of different places, uh, there is no other place on earth that I know of, where you've got thousands of meters of section ex expressed over really hundreds of kilometers. And I'm thinking particularly the outcrops in Pakistan, but the outcrops in, in, in uh, India and Nepal are, are there. They're not quite as continuously exposed because of the vegetation cover. But in the, in the Potwar Plateau of Pakistan and extending west across the, the Indus River into the Banu Basin, and then ultimately down towards the Suleiman Range, you've got uh, literally hundreds of kilometers of exposure of thousands of meters of section. And in the Potwar region, because of the paleomagnetic stratigraphy coupled with the radiometric dating of volcanic ashes, these sediments have been dated in some cases uh, extraordinarily precisely and give us an unusual and in fact pot potentially unique record of uh, faunal evolution, landscape evolution, over a vast region. And, you know, someone might say, well, the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming, someone might say something down in the, in the uh, Pantanal of South of, uh, of uh, Argentina. And there may be some basins in, the, in China, in Tibet, uh, in Mongolia. That's really, I, I don't have as much knowledge up there. And I don't think Doug is on the call tonight, but uh, it may be that somewhere in the Tarim Basin or in the, some of those northern basins and near the Tian Shan Mountains, there may be some exposures of material comparable to the Shawaliks, but I, I do not know of them. So uh, for, for me, the Shawaliks are the world's most complete exposure of continuously accumulated sediments over large areas that, that I know of. And um, I'll invite people's discussion of that. Uh, the exposures are tens of kilometers long, and, and Kay and Catherine mentioned walking out the U sandstone. Uh, I think they said 30 plus kilometers. And uh, Brian Willis and his work down along the north side of the uh, salt range 
also walked out units in the Kamlial that could have gone for tens of kilometers. And this is a relatively common phenomenon in the Patwar Plateau. And then as, as John Barry really emphasized in the beginning of our seminar, the superimposed occurrence of fossils in indisputable superposition is one of the wonderful things that's come out of the collections. And the early collections that Advait and, and others discussed, uh, in some cases, the provenance of the specimens is a little bit unclear. But in, in, during the course of the work of the Yale-Harvard group uh, in particular, uh, there were thousands of localities that were collected and uh, tens of thousands of specimens documented and all of them are in indisputable superimposition. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I like Catherine's comment uh, that you can take a long walk on the Miocene landscapes. Uh, and that's a, that's a, quite a wonderful and charming thought. And uh, I'll remind everybody that your presentations are available on YouTube. There's a YouTube channel, which I think I circulated in an email earlier today or yesterday. And I encourage you, if you want to revisit some of these lectures, hop back onto the YouTubes and uh, you can you can see people's discussions. Let me see if I can. So now the, the Shawaliks are in it, having said that they are vast and well exposed and continuous, et cetera, et cetera, they encompass a variety of dramatic things, including very dramatic changes in lithology. So the so-called formations or members of the Shawalik group, which would include things like the Dogbatan, the Nagri, the Chinji, uh, the Kamlial, the Murray, et cetera. Uh, each of those units, as has been mentioned by previous speakers, uh, can be well-defined at a type locality like a rest house or something. But as you follow them laterally, and this is evident even to uh, workers in the 1940s and 50s, uh, the facies change laterally. And so there are, I think as Kay mentioned, there's many opportunities for happy discussions in the field about what a particular rock name should be, uh, because the, once you step too far away from the rest house where it's defined, uh, the lithology can change significantly. And that cha those changes are both lateral and vertical, so not too surprisingly, but they are profound changes. And if you're standing in the thick sandstones of the Nagri, which is equivalent, I think, to the Nahan beds in India, it's a very different world from the Chinji, which is rich in shales, particularly red shales or mudstones in Pakistan, or the Dogpatan. And there are different worlds in terms of lithostratigraphy, and they must have been different worlds in terms of depositional landscapes. Uh, there are dramatic changes in the flora that have been identified, particularly through the, the isotope work that Turi pioneered and, and discussed, and, and Lisa also discussed it, and Catherine and Kay mentioned it as well. Uh, so there are profound changes from a forested landscape to a savanna type landscape, somewhere in the six to seven million year time frame, uh, And those would have been very dramatic changes to the landscapes of the uh, Shawalik series as we study them in the, in the Potwar region and in, in India as well. And then of course, there, those are tied to dramatic changes in fauna, the, the animals that were there change through time. And there's big questions about how they change. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then there are inferred dramatic changes in climate. And the changes in climate are perhaps tied to changes in topography. And uh, the changes in topography have been dramatic. Of course, the rise of the Himalayas themselves, the uplift of the Tibetan Plateau, and its associated impact on the monsoonal uh, weather patterns, which Peter Cliff discussed and uh, Doug Burbank discussed, uh, and I think Yanni discussed it as well, Yanni Nyman. So, so these uh, phenomenon of change are recorded in these rocks. And many of us have asked the question about which drove what. And I think that one of the conundrums of all of us is, is trying to define a genetic pattern uh, we recognize the changes, but then what is the driving mechanism? And this might be one of the holy grails of our of our collective uh, efforts is to try to figure out what are 
uh, the causative agents for changes as illustrated in this little set of notes here. And I, I'll just mention that that's a common theme, whether you're in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming or the Turkana Basin of Kenya or other parts of the world. And some of you might remember Peter Molnar wrote that paper uh, about chicken and egg. And I've got that somewhere relatively near at hand here, but uh, Peter Molnar, and he might've had a co-author on that paper, but they, they point out the fact that in some cases, the records are sufficiently indistinct that you can't tell what's driving what. And so they actually have a title of a paper about the chicken and the egg, which comes first. And that's a good question to think about. Uh, my, now I'm, I'm gonna break my discussion into these uh, different uh, packages here. And I, I just wanna cover deformation and evolving topography. And I'll just mention a few uh, a few things. Um, we had uh, lectures by Abdul Kayyam and, and Humagani uh, about these the, the patterns and, and reconstructions of some of these deformations patterns uh, in the Potwar and in the Trans-Indus area. Uh, Andrew Miggs talked a little bit about uh, some of the genetic causes for these things in terms of, of structural style. And uh, uh, it was also followed up by Mona Lisa, who talked about the, the fact that, of course, the, the deformation is ongoing, the evolving topography is ongoing, and that leads to uh, earthquakes, which are, of course, active today. Uh, we talked about the different settings of the basins, and uh, Doug talked about the Kashmir Basin, and uh, Shahid Iqbal and Doug both talked about the Peshawar Basin. These are both piggyback basins, meaning they're riding on the back of a thrust sheet, and the modern Potwar Plateau is an example of a piggyback basin. The, the loose deposits that accumulated somewhat enigmatically on the top of the Potwar are in a piggyback basin. And then the Kathmandu Basin was mentioned. Uh, the Kathmandu Basin is a piggyback basin in Nepal. So the, this concept of piggyback basins is, is, uh, is relatively widespread. And, and then the, the timing of those basins is something that's interesting to consider because the Kashmir Basin in particular is very young. Uh, the Pir Panjal uplift took place somewhere around 4 million years ago, and the entire Kashmir Basin was not there prior to the development of, of, the, of the Pir Panjal frontal range. And of course, the, the lakes of Kashmir are tucked in on the backside of that system. The faults are still active. This is a, a, a picture, I think Andrew showed this, uh, defining uh, some tilt tilted terraces, uh, and the, these are things you can trench. And of course, the earthquakes are still breaking the landscape today. So this is a matter of, uh, of critical importance and something that could be followed up. And I know that GSP mentioned, uh, I think in, in Mona Lisa's talk, they talked about uh, the fact that they're, they're working on this. And also uh, in Andrew's talk, there was a follow-up question from a GSP uh, in Islamabad about uh, earthquake monitoring. So an active area of research and endeavor that is uh, uh, particularly important today and for which there might be funding available if you if you sort of looked at it from that point of view. Uh, Andrew talked about the fact that the these faults are episodic and that the strain can be uh, built up because the faults become locked. And he described creeping faults versus locked faults. And uh, both uh, Andrew and uh, Mona Lisa talked about the challenges of trying to figure out recurrence intervals on uh, earthquake episodes. And that remains a big challenge. Uh, Doug Burbank talked about the importance of the monsoon as did uh, Peter Clift. And uh, Doug studies tectonic geomorphology and the influence of, of topography on precipitation. And he had some wonderful precipitation diagrams. I think I've got one coming up. Uh, and just to emphasize the fact, let me just see if it's there. Yes, it's here. So the, uh, this is from Doug's work and uh, the blue colors are areas of very high rainfall. Uh, Doug mentioned that there's some places where there's two bands of rainfall and some places where there's one band of rainfall, but his work and the work of his colleagues has indicated that there's a tremendous impact on topography because of rainfall patterns. And it is very clear to us that the shape of the Himalayan fronts 
and the shape of the mountain systems in, in the Himalayas in general are influenced by the fact that you're eroding vigorously on the south side of the system, whereas the northern side is in a rain shadow and there are some glaciers and some there's some erosion, but the vast majority of the erosion is on the front side associated with the precipitation. So this is the picture today. And in Peter's discussion, Peter Cliff's discussion and, and Yanni Naiman's and others, uh, I think Doug as well, reminded us to think back through time and think about the evolution of the monsoon through time. When did the monsoon get started? Uh, Peter Clift was quite emphatic on the fact that it's a mysterious thing and uh, perhaps relatively poorly known. We understand the monsoon today, mas or menos, but to understand the monsoon going back in time requires both an understanding of topography and also latitudinal situation. And uh, it's, a, it's a poorly understood phenomenon. And the record is relatively poorly understood from the Indus cone. Uh, people have studied the, both the Indus and the Ganges cones in the submarine environments. And that may be where some of the broader scale answers come in the future, but that remains to, to come. So this interplay between uh, precipitation, tectonics, which is precipitation would be climate. So climate, tectonics, uh, erosion rates, deformation rates, and paleogeomorphology is one that is still considerably uh, mysterious uh, to me. And uh, I'm going to step on to, to depositional systems, just talking about uh, really the, the stratigraphic record. So this is sort of what I'm keenly interested in this. And I don't, yeah, I think I've got Kay's slide here just to remind us what we're talking about. But this is the work from the, from the people at CORE. And the U sandstone is somewhere in there, it might be hung on the U sandstone. But in any case, the interplay between different river systems is something that we all see if we look at the Shawalik sediments long enough. And uh, we, numerous people talked about it. Uh, Kay talked about it, Catherine talked about it. Uh, and it was discussed in terms of, of uh, you know, whether it's being driven by, by climate change or precipitation change. Uh, some of Doug's discussion about that. Shahid Iqbal in his discussion of the Peshawar Basin talked about the different river systems, the, the Kabul River and the Indus River. Uh, and we had a lot of discussion about the interplay of river systems. The, in this image, you're seeing the, the so-called uh, blue-gray and buff sandstones. And these are remarkably distinctive units. They can be clearly differentiated in the field. And in the Eastern Potwar, we talked about the white sandstones and the brown sandstones. And interestingly enough, we still haven't married closely together the observations from CORE and the observations from the Eastern Potwar, but the, uh, the top white sandstone is a marker bed that we used repeatedly in the, in the uh, Eastern Potwar. And it's quite a bit younger than the, than the uh, U sandstone. So there was some residual white sandstones in the Eastern Potwar that persisted later than they did in the core area which is an interesting geometric problem, which I haven't gotten my head around. But uh, it is no doubt to me that the, the white sandstones or the, maybe the blue-gray sandstones uh, contain the blue-gray horn blends that indicate they come from the Khoistan area. And they're carried by a, at least a relative of the Indus River, if not the Indus River proper. There was a lot of discussion in the seminar about the different magnitudes of the sandstone beds and whether the sandstones were big enough to be Indus River sands. And uh, I think Brian Willis uh, was studying that. And, and I think Kay mentioned that um, uh, Bridge or Leader, one of them came down and looked at, and the, in many cases, the rivers, the channels that we see in the rock record, particularly in the Dok Bhutan, uh, are not big enough to be Indus River, quote unquote, but perhaps the sandstones lower in the section in the Nagri may be uh, big enough. And I don't know enough about the paleo currents in the Nagri, but I'm quite confident that we see uh, pale colored sandstones leaving the Potwar Plateau heading towards the east as indicated on Kay's diagram and indicated in our work in the Eastern Potwar. And uh, there is a conundrum because the people working in the Indus Cone, and that would be Peter Clift and, and Yanni Naiman and others, uh, believe that they've got a continuous record of the Indus River uh, in the Indus Cone. And that may be, but, it, but at least some of the Indus River possibly 
uh, went over to join the Ganges. And we've talked about that a lot. And that's the kind of thing that needs further work because the, the, the mapping evidence and the geological evidence suggests it. And we need to reconcile our surface observations in the Shawaliks with the submarine observations in the Indus Cone uh, south of Karachi. That all needs to somehow be brought uh, back together again. So there's a need for increased paleogeographic and paleogeomorphic studies. Uh, and that could involve provenance. Peter Zeidler talked about provenance, uh, looking at the mineralogy, and he talked about zircons and the zone zircons, and he stressed the fact that the, there's a temperature record uh, as well as a, as a lithological record in the uh, materials that are being brought down into the uh, sedimentary uh, record and being dated in various ways. And you're really dating the time of cooling of some of these different minerals. And uh, Peter and colleagues have noted that there's very little lag time. If I remember some of their work, the, the minerals are eroded and then almost immediately deposited. And uh, some of the mineral grains uh, have almost the same age as the sediments that contain them because they're so rapidly uh, tucked into the sedimentary record once they exit the Himalayan front. Uh, we also briefly mentioned the oil and gas production, which has motivated some of the research in the in the Shawaliks, particularly the seismic data. And uh, uh, Andrew Miggs and, and colleagues from the University of Oregon have used those seismic data to interpret the uh, geometry of the uh, of the uh, potwar and and we also had some of the work that was that was talked about by Abdul and Hamad Ghani uh, also mentioned the seismic data and that's coming because of the oil and gas production uh, which is I think relatively modest but it's there and uh, it's there to a point where it's also present on the surface and Samina Siddiqui from Peshawar University uh, discussed the fact that the uh, hydrocarbons need to be uh, cleaned up. If you have uh, spills or if there's an area of production where there's uh, hydrocarbons on the surface, uh, you can use a variety of organic uh, or organisms to help uh, dissipate the hydrocarbons. And Samina was mentioning the fact that this was a topic that was interested to her and uh, relevant to the nation and uh, that she might need some funding. And I think that there was an opportunity there if I didn't mistake my ears uh, that Kasim John was thinking that he might know of some sources of funding uh, to support that kind of uh, research that helps the entire nation, sort of a, you know, sort of directed research. Uh, and then uh, paleoecology, just to get to the next chapter here, is, is really the, it might be, you might, you might say that the, the geological framework uh, and the tectonics and geomorphology really set the stage for the paleoecology and how did the how did the surface of the land change through time? And that's uh, of course documented by the character of the river systems as we interpret it from the stratigraphy, but it's the paleontology, the paleontological record that uh, it really speaks to the who was around on the surface. And Catherine Badgley and Kay, Berensmeyer, Jason Head uh, talked about that, Ak Akbar uh, from Lahore and Rajiv uh, from India and Advait uh, all talked about the paleontological record. Uh, and there's a fantastic record. The Harvard Yale group has uh, 1,300 localities. Uh, John Barry mentioned the data management challenge with 50,000 catalog specimens. I think uh, Catherine mentioned that there's on the order of 300 species identified. Uh, and uh, it's, an, it's a fantastic story. And the, those fossils didn't get into the rock record by accident. And of course, the science of taphonomy, which Kay helped put together, uh, has been instrumental in, in, in understanding the, the landscapes and how fossils accumulate in, in, uh, in the uh, channels and, and in the soils above the channels. And curiously enough, as Kay mentioned, the, a lot of the fossils are not in lags on the bottoms of the channels as they are in many parts of the world, they occur in the upper parts of the channels and in the overlying, maybe the bases of the overlying paleosols. And uh, that's a, a, a pattern that has been proven again and again uh, as they collected the fossils along the outcrops of, near core. And uh, so that's a, a, a definite taphonomic overlay. Uh, and, and we use the integration between the, the, uh, the fossils 
And then their, their isotopic composition, you can get the isotopes either out of the paleosols from the cancars, the calcium carbonate nodules, and also from the teeth of the fossils. And they tell a common story that Turi uh, told us about and Lisa mentioned as well. Uh, as you go from a C3 to a C4 uh, landscape around six to seven million years ago, uh, this represents a transition from, from browsing to grazing, uh, from, from a forest to savanna. And I think I've got, I just wanted to, I'm putting Julius's pictures here, recognizing that they're, they're, they were loaned to us. So these pictures uh, have been shown in the seminar, but uh, Julius uh, Ksotny, you guys will help me pronounce the last name. He was with us in one of the seminars. But just at a glance, and these are sort of a low resolution, just so you can see the left and the right. Um, it's a Chinji uh, view on the left, and then more of a Dokpatan view on the right. And you're you're really you're transitioning from a forested uh, landscape to a savanna landscape. And the animals, of course, changed as well. And and did the changing flora drive the changing fauna? One could say yes, maybe. And did the changing climate? drive the transition from C4 to C, from C3 to C4. Uh, one could ask that question and uh, I don't necessarily know the answer. And then the, so the evolutionary dynamics, you know, how are, how are animals changing uh, is a big question to me. And I can certainly see immigration events well-documented and uh, Advait talked about that. Uh, so there are a combination of, of immigration and presumably evolution in place uh, events going on in, in this landscape and a challenge to tease that out. And then Parth talked about the, the search for human remains, uh, they're oddly absent. And uh, one of the challenges is you get into the younger Shivalics, you get into the uppermost part of the Shivalics, you get a coarser and coarser faces, there's less and less fossils preserved. And uh, there's also a lot of reworking. So the there's a challenge there just in terms of the caliber of the rock record, but human presence is extremely enigmatic. We do not have a, a fossil hominid record. The stone tool record is, is, is uh, dis under discussion and uh, remains a topic for future work. So uh, I'm gonna just mention these three topics right here, and then I'm gonna unshare my screen and we can launch into a discussion, but clearly, uh, learning more about paleo environments, uh, doing more time calibrated fossil collecting is important. <clears throat> and then this idea of, of understanding river histories. And I, I've got a couple more slides here. I just wanna, this is something that Doug and I put together showing a block diagram of change through time and space. But what I wanna hop through to is the, we use the paleo mag record and we use mapping. And then I just wanna end on this slide just to, point out, and I, I mentioned this at the very beginning of the seminar, but um, we have mapped uh, magnetics on the ground. And this is the work that Gary and many of his students worked on together with Noy Johnson and Rashid and, and Javed Khan and so many others. And it allows us, this is the Pabi Hills near Jhelum, and you'll see a magnetic map on the upper left. And then the lower right is a time map. And we are assembling these time maps. I've actually taken the time to remap the the uh, strike strike lines in the in the potwar, and we are we have assembled a series of these time maps, and we're aiming them for publication, perhaps in the in the journal from Peshawar University. But they'll they'll soon be available, and and you can walk out onto the landscape and collect specimens of whatever age you wish in order to fill your record of uh, faunal change through time. So this is a product of the labor of uh, many and uh, something that we should all be thinking about how to apply it. Because of course you could apply it to any other study. You could use it in your paleo geomorphology studies, uh, you can, which we did in the, in the Eastern Potwar. Uh, and you can use it for uh, provenance studies, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the rocks uh, are well exposed and well dated and that invites uh, lots of opportunities for further work. And let me um, stop sharing and turn back on my camera. And I think I'm now with you and I think we've got a fair crowd here. And I'm just gonna uh, open it up for discussion uh, 
And I'd, it doesn't necessarily need to be questions, but you can just chime in with thoughts. And uh, I might maybe actually invite Gary, since we were having a discussion a few minutes ago. Um, Gary, if you're still with us, you might uh, mention the Crinean article just to sort of get people flowing if you're still here. Yes, I am. Uh, good morning. Yet before we started the program tonight, we were talking about, you know, the history of various aspects of the uh, <clears throat> geological record uh, of the Suoliks that have been looked at by people in the past. And it had occurred to me at the time that uh, one of the classic papers by Paul D. Cronin, published in the American Journal of Science in 1937, is a paper on the petrology of the Suwalik berries based on some samples that G. Edward Lewis, who was a graduate student at Yale at the time, had brought back from India uh, and Pakistan, or I should say India in general uh, at that time, which was part of his PhD research on uh, mammalian fauna, among other things. Uh, at any rate, Cronin took these hand specimens and evaluated not only the sandstone petrology, but also uh, hand specimen petrology. And actually in a very prescient paper, talks not only about what the erosional record of the Himalayas is, but also what the climatic implications are of what one sees in the various um, facies of the, uh, of the Suoliks or formations at the time, considering the Nagri and the Chinji and the, the Bokutan and so forth. So I think as a starting point for many people to think about how a synthesis of um, geologic history, both, I mean, uh, both uh, petrographically and um, perhaps paleoenvironmentally was initiated what does this mean? 70 some years ago, uh, and in many cases still holds true today, based merely on sitting in one lab, looking at someone else's hand specimens, uh, well documented, of course, and uh, putting this together in a reasonably coherent uh, uh, argument. Again, American Journal of Science, uh, I think Bob has uh, maybe spoken the reference. To yeah, we, we, thank you, Gary. We we've got the reference, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get a PDF of it one way or another. Uh, Bob, Bob, I I sent you the the the, the manuscript. You can okay, check so your email. <laughs> yeah, I just got it. Yeah, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, yes, Gary, and to yourself. Well, yeah. I sent it to you also. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, thank you, guys. We'll we'll put it up on the website so people can yeah. find it on the yeah. It's yeah. a great paper. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> I've had it because we're working on this book, and but I had it like when I started as well. No, I, I had it. I couldn't find it tonight, so uh, you know I was stuck. Uh, a couple other comments, Bob. Kind of following up on uh, some of your presentation earlier, uh, I think about the two groups that that came into existence in the seventies. Uh, from the US that, that began working in Pakistan and our collaborative efforts, both with the GSP and a little bit with uh, Oregon State University, but most definitely with uh, University of Peshawar. I consider us in, a, in sort of a, a dichotomous way. Uh, the Dartmouth Peshawar project took a look at the Suolic sequence as exposed in essentially the, uh, I don't want to call it the neotectonic expression of uh, Suwalik deformation, but, but basically we all sort of agree that a lot of things began to happen about 4 million years ago in terms of reorganization of the structural uh, expression of the northern margin of the, of the foreland uh, and its, its fold bill. In a sense, the dartmouth Peshawar project spent a lot of time in, a, in reconnaissance mode. And what we ended up looking at were a lot of places all the way from the Trans-Indus all the way into Kashmir, Peshawar Basin, in which we evaluated uh, temporal distribution of 
of, of uh, strata over, uh, you know, literally tens, if not thousands of kilometers of section, uh, assisted by paleomagnetic stratigraphy. Whereas on the other hand, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm generalizing here vastly, but uh, the Harvard Yale GSP uh, research focused essentially on that interval of time, pre-deformational reorganization, essentially late Miocene, maybe into a little bit of the early Pliocene, but uh, two different aspects, one which dealt with extreme detail of stratigraphic sections on the one hand, and I'm talking about mainly the, the Yale Harvard uh, group, as opposed to sort of a reconnaissance mode in which we tried to get a handle on distribution, duration, um, facies distribution, of course, and um, temporal distribution. But with the implication behind that of looking at when the deformation began and how it expressed itself in various of these structures that enable us to see many of this uh, stratigraphy. No, I think, Gary, I think, I think you're right. I think the the, the, the two worlds are, are a little bit different. And, and also the, the paleontological record as you climb higher in the section becomes a little bit more sparse. So I think the, the uh, Yale, Harvard, GSP group, you know, they focused on, on the paleontological record in, in a geological context. Uh, and then you know, the, the Eastern Potwar, particularly in the younger part of the section that we tended to focus on, was enjoying active deformation. And so uh, there's two different stories. One story is the evolution of life through time. Another story is the evolution of mountains through time. Right. And, and the Shawaliks tell them both. And I, th I think Kay had her hand up. Uh, Kay, if you wanna pop in. Uh, uh, well, I just, uh, thanks, Bob. I, I was just gonna mention that I sent you the PDF so you could post it for everybody for Cranine, so um, that was my my hand up. But um, I could ask about the white, the age of the last white sandstone that you said was a marker in the Eastern power. Cause I mean, this sort of ties back into the tectonic story, uh, potentially at least. And at Rotas, the, those blue gray sandstones go up to, uh, I think younger than six million. They do go young. Yes, they do. Because the top white sandstone of Rotas is actually up in the in the river, up at the, it's actually in the river when you cross the river, the top white sandstone's there. So, um, but it's it's wispy. You know, the top white sandstone is wispy, meaning it's thin. And uh, I guess that if I took your diagram from core, I, I, you know, of course we're coming way up above it. And I I just put some shazams with some little wispinesses going up to the northeast and yeah but even wispy it's it's still it's still there I mean it's just no, it's, catching it's, the edge of edge of it and I yeah. uh, in the Nagri the current directions are going east and southeast okay and, you know at, at the well, around Dok Bhutan well did did leader or bridge think the Nagri could be Indus River. Uh, well, they didn't. Uh, this was John Bridge was out with us a number of years, and he had mm -hmm. three students, uh, one of whom was Willis, one of whom was Imran Han, uh, and one of them was my, the other was Mike Salea, and they studied different parts of it. But um, Brian, at least, did the most detail down in the Gabir area, and he didn't think any of those rivers, even though they were up to 30 metered thick sandstones that were multi-storied. He didn't think any of them were, were big enough to be the Indus, but you know, he might be wrong about that. Well, you know, I, I think a first order, there are a lot of very large questions that remain unresolved. And, you know, the question about, well, what's the monsoon uh, doing, if anything? Uh, the question about which river is which uh, is, is you know, fascinating and very first order. So it's not, it's not a small question. And uh, I think that the, uh, the opportunity to wor work on these today by, by students in Pakistan is there. I mean, you could take, we've got a huge amount of calibrated rock 
meaning the, the age is known. Uh, and we're trying to put that stuff together on this, this website, the Shawalik Stratigraphy website. I'm trying to get every paleo mag section I can find on there. And uh, there's thousands and thousands of meters of section documented there. So easily accessible. And then the question is, well, you know, you can measure paleo currents with a, with a compass and you can look at mineralogy and the, and, and I think that it, it's, it remains curious to me that the, the, the surface geology suggests that the, the, these sandstone beds were leaving the potwar area to the east. <laughs> and, and then, you know, wh when did the Indus River, you know, properly flowed down through, you know, through Atok and down to the, to the Indus Cone? And, and I don't have an answer for that, but what I'm anticipating is that there was some kind of piracy event that, that grabbed the Indus and took it down into the cone. And before that, there was a river. So I don't doubt that there was a river before that. And uh, so, so Yanni and Peter Clift and others who look at the Indus cone, that, but it, it might not have been the full Indus as we know it today. And another question I'm just gonna throw to the group is uh, the, the Pleistocene uh, for us is a big climate event. And uh, we studied the Pleistocene and, and it, you know, it's a very profound climate event. It knocks our socks off when we look at it. And then how is it manifest in the Shawaliks? And, and uh, you know, the, uh, we asked, we've asked that question a couple of times in the seminar. And I think Doug, Doug might have said, well, maybe the Pleistocene was so quick that it doesn't show up. <laughs> but yet we've got a lot of record. And, and it's startling to me that, that the Pleistocene, which has to have been a climate change phenomenon in the Himalayas, is, I'll just say, dimly understood by looking at the Shawalik sediments. And, and uh, I, I know a person who wrote a thesis that was entitled The Plyo Pleistocene Evolution of the Jellum Reentrant or something or other, and, and that would have been me. And uh, it, it, I did not notice that the Pleistocene affected the sedimentation patterns in the Shawalik. So, and, and then it could also be that the, the system is dominated by, by tectonics and maybe the, the gross geomorphological changes that are happening in the last three to 4 million years obscure the fact that there was a climate change event 2.4 million years ago with the onset of the Pleistocene. And, and, I, and I'll be quiet. I see other people have their hands up. So uh, I don't know who wants to moderate here, but um, yeah, uh, I think that was uh, Catherine. We'll, we'll listen to Catherine and uh, followed by Professor Kasimza. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, Bob, for that interesting overview. I just wanted to, give it, given that we're reflecting on the whole seminar series, I wanted to just make a couple of points that stood out to me. Uh, one is um, how many questions there are still to be answered. In, yeah. the, um, in the in the record, and um, that's not a trivial point. Um, I think many of us who worked there during our what is much of our professional lives, the, uh, on the one hand, we have a fair amount to show for what we've done. On the other hand, I think we are highly aware that all what whatever work we have accomplished has simply revealed the really interesting questions that remain. And we sincerely hope that the, the younger students listening to these talks have become interested in some of those questions and mm. will take them forward in your own lives and um, make something of them. You have an extraordinary um, country and an extraordinary sequence to be working with. Um, the other point that I think is um, worth noting is that Almost all of the presentations that you've heard involve um, integrating information from different disciplines. And that has certainly been the probably the outstanding feature of the interactions that I've had with the group I've collaborated with, the Harvard Geological Survey of Pakistan group. And I've learned a tremendous amount from having being surrounded by people whose expertise was different from my own. And um, I continue to be uh, learning new things from colleagues literally daily. 
And I hope that um, that the the interdisciplinary nature of these research questions and the answers that that eventually emerge has also become evident through this series. And I encourage people to remain curious not only about their own specialty, but what other disciplines have to offer. And I'll let others um, speak after this. Yeah, uh, Professor Kassinger. Okay, thank you. I think you can't see me, but that's a separate issue. Uh, Bob mentioned that the possibility or uh, the question whether ancient man wandered in the late Shivalik in this region or not. And that uh, brought to my memory a couple of papers written by Helen Randall many, many years ago, where she described some some stone, apparently stone tools uh, to in the two million years old Shivalik uh, deposits of uh, Potwar. I think it would be interesting if she's still in geology and uh, can spare time that in our next series of seminars, we invite her to, uh, to to give a presentation, particularly on this aspect of our research. Thank you, Bob. Bob, you, do you want to add something, or uh, we should take on the next? Uh... Well, I, of course, I agree, uh, Kasim, and, and uh, it would be it'd be interesting. If we could have a whole, you know, seminar on uh, on on ancient man and the the record as seen in in both uh, Pakistan and India and and in other parts of Southeast Asia it'd be an intriguing question so I know those sediments around Rawat were, were problematic and there was a lot of discussion this was uh, just southeast of Rawal Pindi and then I was noticing on Google Earth if anybody goes to look at it on Google Earth it's been entirely excavated to turn into a some some kind of a new colony or new subdivision so I think the outcrops that were that had the purported stone tools in the Rewat area uh, might have been completely uh, dug up. So that's a, that's a challenge for us. I, I see that there's a uh, Sudesh has been. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I'm uh, Sudesh Vadavan from uh, India, presently settled in Jaipur. I'm a former Director General, Geological Survey of India. So thank you very much, uh, Bob. It has been a great series. And thanks to Irfan John and his entire team. It has been excellent presentation. And we have been uh, really greatly benefited uh, by various themes that are covered. I'll make uh, two short comments. One, see, from uh, uh, Indian uh, side, the Shwaliks are important. But our typical type sections, they are now in Pakistan. So they are not accessible to us so readily. So we had to you know, reinvent the wheel and start looking for our type sections in Indian uh, part of the territory. So my uh, uh, advice to the field going uh, officers is to look for the field criteria so that uh, the field geologist can identify the typical um, uh, stratigraphic sections. See, what you have been uh, giving us is the details based on the laboratory inputs the paleomagnetic uh, signatures and other details which have been worked with a lot of laboratory backing. But uh, we need to really establish and bring out some good publications on the field criteria, which will fix up the stratigraphy even for a beginner, for a field geologist to go and he can identify which part of the Swalik stratigraphy that he is looking at. That is uh, one. And other is uh, we have uh, uh, got a very good uh, a site which we have developed as a geotourism site. Uh, mm. it, it is the Swalik fossil site at a place called Saketi. It's close to Chandigarh. So we have preserved many of the in situ fossils, many of the uh, mammals and uh, many of the flora and fauna, they are preserved there and many of the models are also created. It's a huge uh, tourist attraction also. So if a similar mm. kind of uh, geotourism site can be established, in some suitable site in Pakistan, wherein the typical uh, fauna and flora and the fossils and the rock types are preserved and showcased as a real good uh, geotourism site. 
and also you know some field excursions can be built up some field yeah. uh, excursions uh, uh, pamphlets can be brought out which will yeah. be indicating the typical uh, type sections which were you know originally mapped by the britishers for example medlicott when he was here he coined this term schwalix in 18 uh, i think 1864 or so the medlicott he had coined this term schwalix so uh, we need to share this uh, uh, natural heritage and geodiversity amongst the two nations for the future generations thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you very much uh, sudesh pradhan uh, i don't know if professor kasimjan would like to comment on that because it's really an important point and uh, obviously the science doesn't have any boundaries and sure. yeah well uh, thank you i totally agree that we should have the opportunity to uh, move across the borders and uh, be able to do to have a complete picture of geological formations and geological structures unfortunately this is not the case at the moment but i am hopeful i mean i would very much like for example i'm doing a lot of work now in south east go pakistan on the protozoic uh, late uh, new protozoic granitoids and yeah. they have wonderful wonderful uh, um, rocks in the malani igneous sweet across the yeah. border in rajasthan and yeah. uh, many of the indians wish to come on this side and i want to go to the other side but within that i would like to mention however that and i think it would be for the interest of uh, dr udavan that yeah. uh, in the past we have had some uh, international seminars in which sizable uh, contingent from india came and participated once this was in 1979 we had a big conference um, uh, which was on kohistan and there was a tra uh, traverse all along up to hunza then in 1998 we had a uh, himalayan um, conference the um, um uh, and in that we uh, we had one trip to pakistan the other trip was to the salt range and i remember about 15 people from india came and some went and enjoyed uh, enjoyed the shivalik trip and some of the people i can mention included uh, uh um uh, dr bhargava dr sena uh dr thakur uh and uh, a few others so yeah. i i agree but the suggestion that we should have a a a, a tour geo tourist uh, site in the shivaliks of pakistan is wonderful and so uh, I, yeah it's really wonderful suggestion yeah yeah and i think we can do it at the foothills of the salt range Yeah, uh, sure. there are some places where uh, they're developing that uh, we could do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Kwasin Jawam. I think uh, we have met uh, during one of these uh, GeoSAS meets in New Delhi. I, uh, I I don't think whether you remember we have met it and uh, we we had been having this kind of international. In fact, uh, during this uh, 2020 IGC, we were also planning to have a huge. geoscience uh, geofraternity gathering but unfortunately this present pandemic uh, has really deferred it but surely yeah. we look forward to uh, visit many more sites and i can assure you there are number of uh, areas in thar desert wherein uh, we have a lot in common with uh, what is happening in thar parker so there are number of uh, such geological issues which need to be collaborated upon and sorted leave aside the political aspects but we we have a lot of scope of building up uh, our own understanding of the geology of indian subcontinent thank you thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you very much so uh, I, i'm just unable to pick this uh, to know the sequence but i'll just invite k to 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 come up with her comment or whatever she wants to discuss okay um, thank you um thank you very much irfan uh It seems to me, I mean, this is the topic, a proposal for maybe a suite of topics at the next uh, rendition of our seminar series. That is to try to to form some working groups of uh, yeah. interested students and some of us who uh, would would be available to help design some actual research that they could they could do. 
Um, and I mean, I don't know how far you could you could push this, but we've got a whole team of, of potential advisors here. And yeah. there were students that were interested in what we could advise them on. Uh, it just seems like we might as well go ahead and try to do that virtually um, when we can't. I mean, it, even if we could travel freely, it would be hard to get people together physically. But there's a lot you can do with with the images, with the diagrams, and, and with the discussions. That's all I had to say. Uh, yeah, I, I'll invite Rajiv to please. Uh, can, can you all hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Irfan. And I just uh, echo, uh, echo the suggestions by Sudesh and uh, Professor Kasim Jan. And I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, you all, Bob, uh, Gary, uh, Irfan, Mukhtar, uh, Catherine, Kay, all, all of you for this excellent opportunity uh, to, to interact. And uh, uh, really it in enriched our, our understanding of uh, Shivalix. And uh, uh, as far as uh, type section and, uh, uh, and uh, building up something like uh, a geotourism is concerned, we have, in fact, our department at uh, Punjab University, we are also uh, trying uh, our level best to do this, uh, trying to figure out uh, some of the well-dated uh, sections uh, and uh, put them in a, in a perspective uh, as far as... Uh, both uh, uh, in a in a biostratigraphy and paleomagnetic records concern. So so the best would be to to have uh, like for uh, for the middle Shivalix and, uh, and uh, maybe uh, for the Miocene I would say I would say uh, Potwar plateau would be best for for something uh, like this and and uh, and the upper Shivalix being very well exposed, uh, close to uh, Chandigarh and uh, uh, Himachal, uh, would be uh, good to have a, 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 a site that would be, uh, I mean, uh, that would be taken for for Pliocene and uh, Pliocene. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I would love to host any, any, any such a future conference if, if any, any, any collaborative conference is uh, held. I, I, I'm, I, I would certainly be uh, someone who would uh, encourage this and would certainly host such a thing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, Bob, you wanna, uh, I don't know if, uh, yeah, Bob, do you wanna add uh, well, something? I'll just, I'll just quickly mention, uh, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, Dr. Wadwan's uh, comments about uh, type localities. And I'll, if Andrew Meggs was with us, he would be telling us, he would be reminding us about the Jualamuki section. Uh, there's 3,000 meters of, of section that has been documented. And uh, we're, we're actually working on his field notes to try to clarify the map of exactly where the polarity transitions are on the ground. But uh, that's going to be one of the major uh, paleomagnetic reference sections in in that portion of the Shawalik, so right around Jawalamuki, and and I know that Gary Johnson has worked in that vicinity as well. So, so I think that uh, there are opportunities to take the paleomagnetic story that's been uh, discussed here in the Potwar Plateau and carry it directly into India. I mean, it, it has been done. So we have uh, Samina Siddiqui. Um, she wants to add something. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> good morning and good evening to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much for organizing such a nice webinar for me. And I, I have been, oh, I have been learned a lot from the geologist. And now I am thinking about that the soil can be fit in within some of the geological subjects. So nothing else to add. And I'm also Professor Bob. I have been 
from your advice, I am trying and negotiating with OGDCL to have a um, field trial of my research work and hopefully having a meeting with them next uh, after Eid because you know Eid is next next week. So hopefully by the end of this month, we will have a um, meeting with them, OGDCL, to give me an opportunity to take my work from laboratory to the field. And Professor Kazim Jan has helped me a lot, and we have submitted a project. Let's see what's going to happen in future. And I would be like to be a part of this webinar in future after a break. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, yours, Nina. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a comment again from uh, from Sudesh. Uh, if, if that's not the, can you hear me? Dr. Sudesh, okay. It might be from the last time. Uh, this, the hand is still, you know, showing up. So, so yeah, Bob, I think that's that's uh, that's it. We don't have any more. Uh, okay, well, listen, uh, everybody, I think, uh, it's, it's getting very, very late for uh, our people on the East Coast. It's now approaching two o'clock in the morning. And I'm awfully grateful for their comments and, and carefully thought out suggestions uh, given the wee hours of the morning. And uh, what, I, what will happen over the next uh, several weeks probably is there will be, we will circulate some kind of a, a document for people to make suggestions for future uh, seminar topics. Mm -hmm. and. I think that there's, you know, there's no limits. Uh, we've proven the technology works beautifully, and we've uh, obviously established strong collaborations between uh, the, the Geological Survey of Pakistan, Mukhtiar, and uh, Rahat, who's helping us this evening. Uh, so we can uh, continue this in, in a further direction. And I think the opportunity to work together with our colleagues in India is magnificent as well as, of course, with professors and students who are in Europe and in the United States. So I would invite us to uh, recognize the technology is, is at our disposal, and we should consider how, how best to use it. Uh, with that, I'm going to, uh, if there's any other any further input, of course, I, I'm eager to hear it uh, this, this evening for me or this morning for you guys in, in Pakistan. But uh, if... Uh, I think there's something from Professor Kasim Jambo. Yeah, Kasim, do you have a comment? I I don't have a comment. I all I want to uh, to say is I want to thank you profusely, the three of you, um, Bob Reynolds, Efan Jan, and Mukhtar, for all your efforts you. and uh, wonderful coordination, picking up uh, um, exceedingly informed informed and uh, and good researchers. We benefited from this series of uh, uh, webinars tremendously. I have been uh, prompting my colleagues at the National Center of Excellence to ensure that they attend these. And now that we know that you are also compiling these um, uh, for future availability, that is absolutely wonderful. So thank you very much. And I assure you of my personal support and collaboration for the years to come. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kasim. And uh, th thank you very much for your, your strong support for many, many years. Uh, I, I do want to underline that that the uh, YouTube channel uh, that Mukhtiar has been assembling exists, and uh, the seminars are on the channel. And uh, yeah. Mukhtiar has also uh, visited a, a, a mud volcano. So there's, there's starting to be extra material on that uh, YouTube channel as well. So the channel was in the web, uh, in the uh, email that I sent out uh, 24 hours ago. Uh, so please inspect that YouTube channel and uh, recognize that this is a tool that you know came to us through COVID. So it's uh, I, you know I, I you know COVID has been a, a huge challenge for us in so many different ways, but it has also brought us the advantage of uh, increasing our ability to communicate. So. Uh, there's a silver lining to the COVID story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and with that, uh, I, I, again, I'm gonna thank you all very much for your participation over the many months that this has gone on. And uh, I particularly salute the speakers 
And uh, they're gra we're grateful to all of you for your presentations and uh, for your collaboration. And we look forward to uh, continuing this discussion. So uh, we're not going away and we look forward to hearing more from all of you. Uh, but yes, thank you all very much and, and uh, happy Eid for those of you in Pakistan. <laughs> thank you everyone. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Thank you. Bye bye. Yep. Hold on. Thank you.